Good morning. This is Heather Bell Meyer, the president and CEO of the Orange County Chamber of Commerce. We're just going to give a few more seconds for all of our guests to get in. Okay, so now it's good afternoon officially. <laughs> and we're going to go ahead and get started um, to be sensitive to everyone's time. So again, I am Heather Bell Meyer. I am the president and CEO of the Orange County Chamber of Commerce, and I'm excited to welcome you to today to our workplace well wellness series. And today we are being um, graciously hosted by Mim Semp. Uh, we're going to talk about the intergenerational workforce, which is quite interesting. I believe it's a good topic. Um, a little bit about Mim. She is the CEO of Motivity Partnerships, a consulting firm that helps organizations create, integrate actionable and measurable engagement, health and gender DNI strategy for their workforce. She holds certifications in group benefits, worksite wellness, and property casualty insurance. She is also the co-founder and CEO of Global Women for Wellbeing, also known as GW4W. That's a nonprofit organization focused on empowering more healthy female leadership at all levels. And both our organizations are members of the Orange County Chamber of Commerce, which we are very happy to represent. MIM has 25 years of corporate experience in workplace resilience and well being strategy and implementation. And that includes a gender gap and diversity lens. Um, she has oversight of strategy under the Opna umbrella for Goldman Sachs Wellness Program and has worked with more than 70 national and international clients. Mim is a keynote speaker and facilitator for national conferences. She also leads corporate events, workshops, and think tanks using an evidence-based approach. She's a member of the National Wellness Institute and served on their board of directors. She was a member of the Global Wellness Institute's Wellness at Work Initiative from 2015 until 221 and co-chairs the Orange County Chamber of Commerce Wellness at Work Initiative with me. <laughs> she is an advisory board member for the Women's Business Collaborative and her home base is in Blooming Grove where she lives with her husband near Tomahawk Lake. And Mim, I am just so thankful to have you here today to present to us. This is just a, a spectacular opportunity for the chamber and our members. Just wanna give you a little bit of information about what's going on at the chamber. We have, um, Mim, can you flip one, one slide for me? Why is this not? It was flipping and now I am not flipping. I hear you going ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Oh, there we oh, go. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> <Technology>. oh. <laughs> we rock and roll here at the chamber. <laughs> <laughs> so just things that are going on at the chamber, the Meet the Members series is very well re received and, you know, our members really enjoy it, but it's a great way for uh, other members and the general public to know about our members and, you know, all that they have to offer. So we're really excited to continue that every other Monday. You'll find these and all the schedule of events at orangeny.com. Um, and you can also find them on our Facebook page as well. We continue to host our Wellness Wednesdays, um, the workplace tips. Those are in our emails and they're also posted on social media. And those are submitted by our Workplace Wellness Committee of which Mim and I are co-chairs. And we're very proud of these tips being sent out. Um, the Ask the Expert is a great way to make sure that you're staying compliant with everything that's going on in the HR world. Um, Janet from Visions, HR generously donates these tips and you can ask a question by submitting it through the Monday email. And our Small Business Essentials Network uh, continues with a once a month learning opportunity. You can also advise us if there is something that you think would be valuable that you would like to present to the members. Uh, just send an email to info at orangeny.com and we will certainly get you on the schedule. This month, we are going to be hosted by Ethan Allen Workforce to talk about COVID-19 litigation. This should be very interesting, especially if you are a smaller business and do not have an HR or legal department. So without further ado, uh, I will leave it to Mim to guide us through the intergenerational workforce. Well, it is truly a pleasure to be here, and I am um, honored to be here with a lot of our Orange County leadership. 
Uh, I know it has been, as I said, when I got to see some of you live back in May, um, it's been a challenge over the past 18 months. Um, but it's also an enormous opportunity for us to start to rethink how we're going to start to move forward. An intergenerational workforce is um, something that's top of mind for a lot of organizations right now. It's a very, very unique time in our history because we have people working longer than um, ever before. So this is the very first time in work history where we have up to five generations um, in our workforce, uh, depending on what industry you're in. So it's, it's intriguing and there's all kinds of questions about that and, and what does that mean? But at the end of the day, what it really means for organizations is an opportunity to create intentional inclusion, intentional inclusion so that you can keep your competitive edge so that you have a workforce that is truly resilient through all our future changes that we are sure sure to see in the, in the coming years. So it's a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Now, this is a very broad topic, so we're not gonna talk about everything today, but first kind of defining like what are those different generations and kind of what that means to us and what we think about those different generations and what they, um, what, what are the positives and what are the things that we may think of as negatives. Um, how do we use this to tap into talent? Um, when people don't feel like they are purpose-driven or that they are connected or that they are heard, oftentimes we lose that talent or we can't attract the talent that we need. So tapping into talent, I think for many of us as leaders is, is one of the key pieces around this. Next normals, we all know that uh, moving forward, change is going to happen. It is the one constant that we are going to see over and over and over again. And so finding ways to meet those challenges um, in a more intentional way, closing up some of the gaps um, can help us create a stronger bottom line in our organizations. And last but not least, I'm always big about, okay, here's the data. Here's some of the things that we've talked about today, but what are some of the key questions I can ask in my own organization? And um, these questions, in some cases, if you're a solopreneur or a smaller company owner, um, you can also think about these in the context of how you're interacting with your clients. So um, those are the four things that we wanna touch on a little bit today. So I'm gonna dive right in here and look at these five generations. So you could probably tell by my intro that I'm not a millennial. <laughs> a little bit older, been around the block a few times. Um, and when we look at these lists, we're gonna say, well, most of us are, don't have people in the workforce that would be in that first category. But I'd push back a little bit and say, hmm, there are actually people in their late 70s, early 80s that are still working. There are law partners that I know of that are very active and um, not to be political in any way, but if, if we look at the people that are serving in our Congress uh, <laughs> at the national level, we know that we have people in that category that are working every day, that contribute every day um, or not contribute depending on you know, how you view that. But it is interesting that more and more people are working um, into their 70s and early 80s. And I can tell you, even my own mother, who is uh, 84 and thank God very healthy, is still teaching piano after COVID. She's her students have come back, and it is uh, something that gives her great purpose in life, great joy. She loves doing it, and she's actually a, a sought after piano teacher in the Allentown Bethlehem area in Pennsylvania. But we look at somebody in that age category as somebody who's already retired, somebody that can't necessarily contribute. Baby boomers. Um, that's an interesting group because by 2030, all baby boomers will be 65 or older. So if you're a baby boomer, yep, 65, and you may already be in that category coming down the pike. And in fact, what's interesting is that 25% of our workforce in the U S is 55 or older right now. Um, so this, there is a real shifting in demographics in terms of, um, overall workforce. We have our Gen Xers and Millennials, and they make up the bulk of the workforce out there, about 35% um, in each category. And we now have the Gen Zers coming into the workforce, and they about 5%, but obviously kind of understanding where they're coming from, how we can utilize that talent 
how we can build work environments that bring out the best in them um, is really something that is going to hold us in good set if we can be a little bit more proactive around this. Uh, the one category that I did not put out here that has been kind of interesting coming up um, over the last six months is this conversation around Generation C. So Generation C is Generation COVID. And what I find interesting about that is that there are some researchers, some organizational psychologists that are looking at this through the lens of the children 18 and under that have been impacted by COVID and how that is going to impact them moving forward into the workforce. But there is another view of this in that COVID has impacted all of these generations. And so it has started to shift the priorities and what people are actually looking for um, when they're going out and looking for talent. And I think I would, I, I can also probably safely say that that's true for a lot of leaders as well. Um, it has been a huge amount of change and rethinking about where we're gonna go. So I just find it interesting um, and digging a little bit deeper into this about, well, what are the differences and where's the common ground? So what's the same? So this is the part that's a little bit more interactive. I'd invite you to take a little bit of time. And again, this is just stream of consciousness. It's not meant to, you don't need to do any deep think about it, but what are some of the differences that you see from generation to generation in your workforce? or from your particular generation, what do you perceive as being different, different in employees or colleagues that come from different generations? So please feel free to use the chat. Um, if you wanna just throw an idea out there, it's, it's always great to hear and share because um, nobody knows everything. I'm a big believer in when we can share knowledge and we can jump like, oh, wow, I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, it helps all of us grow a little bit. Please feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to interact, um, or you can use the Q&A portion of the, the webinar. Um, we love, Mim loves interaction. So I'm moderating right. that on the backside. <laughs> yeah, so some of the things, you know, again, as I mentioned on the first slide is that people are truly working longer. And I think that's a really important thing for us to understand, um, uh, you know, when we're looking to hire, why are people working longer? Well, there's two practical reasons. Some just have to. If they went through the financial meltdown of 2008 and then were financially impacted by COVID, um, they may not be in a financial position to retire. And so they very much want to stay, um, stay in the workforce. They need to do this. Uh, and we need to think about that, I think, you know, from a countywide perspective, because financial health and well being, particularly as we age, is directly related to public health and well-being. And um, that is, is key to um, also thinking about how we design. So why would I want older and older people working in my workforce, right? <laughs> Good question. And I've actually done a whole talk just on that particular piece for Midwest Business Group on Health um, a couple of years ago. So here's some interesting things that you may not know. Um, we think that the older generations, and I'm talking about, um, you know, your older Gen Xers and your baby boomers are not tech savvy. That's one that you hear a lot. But the truth is, if you've been working in an office environment, chances are you've learned many different programs over the course of your career. You probably use a smartphone. You probably Google and order online and use Amazon um, very much like your younger counterparts. So sometimes there's a misconception about that. Now, when it comes to social media and using it and using it um, wisely in a business context, that's a place where there may be some, some differences. So that's just like one of the little nuances. The idea of loyalty to your company, that's a tough one for many of us, right? We want our employees to be loyal. We want them to show up. We want them to be bought into what we do. And, um, and be a part of making that company grow. But I would venture to guess that any of us on this call knows that um, our grandparents had a very different um, career in many cases. I know people that worked for the same company their entire lives, 40 years at the same company. And um, the company made sure that they had a decent quality of life. They got regular vacation. 
um, there was much more of a family kind of uh, approach in some cases, not in all cases, but in, but in a lot of those. But we know over the past 20 years with everything that's changed, people have changed jobs, changed careers. There are careers that existed 30 years ago that don't exist anymore. There are new careers that we hadn't even thought about. And so when we look at something like loyalty, um, a Gen Zer or uh, you know, one of our, young, or our younger millennials may view this very, very different, differently. What does loyalty mean to them, to an employer? And um, what would incentivize them to stay with us and to be part of our organization as we grow? So there, are, I'm sure that all of you probably have different uh, ways of looking at this. And um, whether it is how people deal with a crisis, I've heard view of the future. Um, if you, obviously, if you're you know, 50 or 60, your perception of what future is is very different from an employee that's gonna come in at 22, 23. But there's also a lot of common ground. And what's interesting from a health and well being perspective is that the more you can find places where there is connection, where there is common ground, the more people feel included, the more that impacts how they communicate with each other. And that actually starts to build a safer psychological environment in your workplace, which then <laughs> leads to great things like better innovation and better creative problem solving and impacting your bottom line in a more positive way. So I'd invite you, if you are starting to think about this, is to take some time with your teams and do this exercise. And if you're doing it with intergenerational employees, um, get really curious about it. Create a space for everyone to be able to express what that is. And so one of the, one of the things that I'm really big on when you start to have these kinds of conversations um, if you have an extrovert learning, you know, leading these conversations, you think that everybody should contribute and I'm going to make sure that everybody has voice in here. I'd ask you to consider that there are going to be some people in that room that want to contribute, but need time to think about it and may want to share something back. So that's just a little tip about trying to find out in your particular workplace, where the real differences are and how you perceive them. And where are some of those commonalities and common ground where you can start to build and I see, is there a question. Uh, it's more of a statement, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention. Eileen, thanks so much for sharing. Most obvious differences between generations, comfort level with technology and preferred communication methods and styles. Great. Yep. Communication, communication, communication. Cannot underscore that enough. And not just in how we verbally talk to each other, but also how things get written. Do we use email? Do you, do you use text for certain things? And what is the, the mix of all those things to make sure that you're communicating across all the generations in your workforce? So I can't um, overemphasize the uh, amount of conversation going on now about the war for talent. It is definitely heating up. And some of you may have seen um, the stats around how many people resigned from their jobs in April. It was the biggest, the biggest amount of um, active employees resigning from jobs in the past 10 years. And I think that should be a heads up for all of us. Okay, we've made it, you know, for many of us, we've made it through um, the worst, hopefully the worst of COVID. Um, why are these people resigning? We really need to think about that. Did they feel included? Um, was this key talent that walked out the door for us? And how are we going to address some of this if we're going to stay viable and keep our competitive edge? So there are very specific things that um, I would highly recommend you think about. Big, big, big fan of mixed age teams, but I'm going to put a caveat around that. That's pretty obvious, right? Well, okay, we want everybody from 21 to 75, you know, and a nice mix of those people so we can truly hear that. But I'd also ask you to then drill down a little deeper, not just mixed age, but mixed gender, and also look at this through a diversity lens so that you truly get a cross section of your workforce. You're gonna get a lot better information back. Um, you're gonna be able to tap into and understand gaps in a clear way if you do this very intentionally. Um, I love, love, love reverse mentoring. And, you know, as, as was brought up, 
when we talk about technology and social media, um, for all our, our younger folks out there that are just on it, they know how to use it, they know how to use it effectively. Like what a great gift to give back to more senior leaders or, or older employees, colleagues, and help them become proficient. Now, the other side of this, and it's very interesting because this is research-based, is that um, in general, more seasoned employees, older employees who have been through more than one crisis tend to be less reactive when we um, come up against change in crisis or there is um, what's perceived as a failure. And so this is one of those really key things that can be helpful for your organization as we move forward. We don't know what's coming around the corner, but if we can strategically teach each other how to better respond to crisis, um, this can help us get through that crisis a whole lot faster and probably with a whole lot less pain. So it's interesting and the research as you dig into it, there's, you know, there's different viewpoints about why that is. I mean, if you're younger and you've never gone through something before, um, it is very scary. I mean, I think any of us that are older can look back on our own careers and go, oh my gosh, when this happened, I thought it was the end of the world. And so that kind of mentoring in this kind of um, world where we are looking at uncertainty on a pretty regular basis can be very, very helpful in helping you, again, revert back to goals, look at key performance indicators, keep you moving forward and growing your bottom line. Um, you don't want a bunch of people running around panicked when there are real solutions that other people, older people or more experienced people may be able to bring to the table more quickly. And your younger people exposed to that are also then gonna become more proficient. And that impacts everybody's mental health and well being. So big plus. Coming from the benefits underwriting background, um, we hear a lot about how do you incentivize getting people to come into your organization and stay at your organization. And so I'd ask you to think about what incentives do we have? Are they truly specific to my employees' needs? Um, there's a lot of like, well, what is this company doing or, or what is that company doing? And sometimes that can be super helpful. It really can. I mean, you can look at some of these other companies and go, well, we're in the same industry. If I'm out there competing for the same talent, maybe I do wanna do some benchmarking around what they're offering and whether that actually makes sense within our working environment. But I'd ask you to couple that with benefits design. And the reason I think this is so important is that um, too often when we do our open enrollment, I know everybody here has probably been through open enrollment uh, at yet a former company or for your employees, but in general, having done probably hundreds of these <laughs> in my career, um, almost everybody reverts right back to healthcare benefits. That's the thing they see in open enrollment. Uh, this gets back to that communication piece. So that if there are key benefits that you know are, are something that is gonna help a demographic in your organization that you don't think understands it, put together a strategy around this. And a key example of that, mental health and well-being. It is everywhere. We know that um, going through COVID and all this change has had a profound impact on mental health and well-being. And so uh, this is one of those key areas where you can um, take a look at you know, the trajectory over the past 18 months, five years, you know, if you have data back that far, um, you can talk to your broker if you have a broker that you work with regularly to get this data and start to bump it up against incentives and your benefits design. This is going to help you build a little bit better strategy so that you can meet the different needs at different generational levels. Uh, an example of that is that you may have um, a high percentage of women between 25 and 40, as an example, fertility issues huge, huge, huge um, cost driver, uh, a lot of questions. And it's something that um, you may need to think about and something that you want to dig into a little deeper. You may have a population of mostly men that are 40 and over, and that may be a whole different ball game in terms of how you want to approach that and what incentives um, you might want to put in place. But a lot of opportunity right now to go back and do that, particularly um, because most of us start to look at, at benefits design and budgets starting in August and September. I And last but not least on this list, I am a huge believer in measurement, measurement, measurement. Too often, um, these become things that we throw at the wall. 
and we hear something exciting that somebody else is doing. We read about a really cool idea. Um, we think, great, let's implement this. And why isn't it working? Or, okay, well, now we don't have time to do this. But I'd ask you to consider as a business leader that if you do that, there is a cost. There is an actual financial cost. And it's costing somebody time in your organization where it might be better spent in other places. So understanding where you are today and what you specifically want to measure around this is really key in terms of having successful integration. And here I, I put this up here to kind of reemphasize this and balance it out with these two pieces. I look at the future and go, we know that there is going to be even more data thrown at us, even more pieces of information than we have ever had before. So 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we were not on Google. We weren't getting 120 to 140 emails a day, which is the average for an office worker. We weren't answering up to 40 emails a day. This is very, very different from what we had in the past. And so, getting very strategic about how you manage information in your organization impacts every single generation. This is one of those commonalities and it impacts mental health and well-being. Neurophysiology, we can process just X amount of information. We know that if you try and do this later and later and later in the day that you've already gone through hundred emails, the quality of work and the, how much you're gonna retain by the end of that time period is not going to be as good. It will also mean more mistakes. So this is kind of just a, a really specific thing that you can start to think about. One other little fact is that every time you move away from a project and go to answer an email, it takes your brain anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds to refocus on that project. So this is a very, very different thing um, and a way that, in way that we worked than we did 30 or 40 years ago. So I can tell you that I personally block off time when I do emails and I block off time when I do project work. And um, that may or may not work for you, but that's an example of something that has shifted and something that you may wanna start to take, um, take a look at. I'd also ask you to strongly consider in our high tech world when and how people are sending out information and when they're expected to answer it. So I always underscore, of course, we're all important. Of course, we wanna have great customer service. But I'd also ask you to consider, does it really matter if it takes two hours to respond and say, thank you for sending this email and I will make sure to get back to you? If you wake up in the middle of the night and you're in a panic about something, do you have to send that email at that time? Um, these are things that get very, very disruptive and start to break down communication, which again leads to um, a sense of disconnectedness within your organization. And again, if you're younger, you might wanna be texting, you're used to doing this. This is just one of those great eye-opening things. Well, maybe I shouldn't be texting my boss at nine o'clock at night because maybe they're taking care of their mother or you know, vice versa. Maybe I don't wanna be sending an email at 7 a.m. to my uh, Gen Zer who uh, may not be paying attention at 7 a.m. in the morning. So there's a lot of little strategic things that you can start to build in from a communication perspective. And it helps you get through these next normals if you have parameters around some of these things. I keep mentioning more for talent because there is um, gonna be a lot of scrutiny by highly talented people and say, what are you measuring? You know, Are you really doing this or is this lip service? And with Glassdoor and so many people sharing information now on the internet, um, I would highly recommend that uh, you walk whatever talk you have out there, whatever that is for you as a leader, as your organization, and what you're doing um, to retain and attract talent, make sure that um, what you are promising you are actually delivering on. And whether that is um, helping people get additional education, whether it's a real mentoring program, um, whether it's allowing people to go part-time if they need to, uh, you know, and you have, and it may or may not work for you. But what I'm saying is that if it is in there, and if you're saying that you, in your handbook or whatever it is, 
Um, most of you, I should, you know, I would hope are doing that, but I've also come up a lot, you know, across a lot of companies where there is, um, a lot of policies, a lot of talk, a lot of leadership training, but in the day to day, it's not necessarily getting played out and it's costing companies, key employees. So the idea is to figure out what you're going to measure, find out what kind of talent you need what you need to be saying and what you need to be able to put in place. And then it always comes with iteration, right? Nobody's going to get it right the first time. That's okay. Maybe you do. I mean, but I, I've seen very, that happen very, very rarely. Good for you if you do. Um, but this idea of being flexible. So what's happening right now, that's a really good example of that. Heard a great conversation about the financial firms, the big firms like Goldman Sachs, and, and I used to be on site there. Um, under the Optum umbrella and running their, their workplace wellness strategy, um, a lot of the big banks are saying, everybody has to come back in. We need you to do this. You're going to have to start commuting again, whatever that is, one size fits all. This is what's important to us. Then on the other side of the fence, you have a lot of the tech companies, the big tech companies saying, we don't care anymore. We've realized that after the past 18 months, we were still productive. We still grew our bottom line. And in many cases, our people work better or want that kind of flexibility. And so we think this is going to help us. So there's no, again, I go back to, there's no one size fits all, but understanding intergenerationally um, what that means for them and how you want to design work going forward is going to be very, very important if you're going to win this war for talent. And then figuring out what your KPIs are going to be around that and understanding who's going to be responsible for actually meeting those, those numbers. We know that there have been some pretty clear barriers that have come up over the past um, 18 months. And they were there in many cases, you know, five years ago. It's just that this unprecedented time has started to um, put front and center some of the issues that um, we need to be much more focused on. For me personally, I can tell you, and this really comes out of a lot of the GW4W data, caregiving, caregiving, caregiving. I cannot underscore that enough. Um, more than 3 million women left the workforce as of February. And a lot of that was because of um, a lot of the upheaval around schools, no access now to daycares, so many daycares that have shut down. Um, but it's also uh, caregivers that are taking care of older adults in their lives. And with an aging workforce, this particular issue is going to become um, more of a pain point for more and more of your, your workforce. I, you know, and I'd ask you to think about it in this way. Uh, you don't necessarily think of millennials as being caregivers, but many of their parents waited to have kids. And so you would be surprised at how many millennials, even younger millennials that are already caregivers to older adults in their lives. And so this is one of those key benefits as you're going through that you might wanna give a little bit of extra attention to moving forward. Um, flex time, I'm sure you've heard this a million times, um, but think about somebody who is doing that caregiving piece and has to make appointments for um, their children and or an older adult or has to follow up with uh, different professionals. Well, those phone calls happen usually you know, their offices are open in the same time that your offices are often open. And so either being a little bit more understanding and allowing people to blend their time so that they can meet those needs, or uh, also maybe, or and or thinking about how you use flex time um, is gonna be very important. And this gets back to barriers and change. It's so easy to give equal treatment to everybody across the board. Everybody gets that. See, we're treating everybody equally. But when you look at this through an intergenerational lens, the conversation really needs to be around how do we give equitable treatment? So do all older workers that, are, that want to be in the workforce, do they necessarily want to uh, move up the ladder? Well, they may not. Do they want to work full time? but they have great skills to bring to the table. This is just a really good example of how we can start to think about this a little bit differently to meet barriers. I don't have enough people that are skilled um, potentially in my workforce that can meet crisis or have that kind of project management um, expertise that I need going forward. Okay, well, maybe there are some people out there that wanna work 
that can be very efficient, that may actually cost you less because you don't have to spend you know, benefits dollars on them, um, but want to be involved and want to be engaged. Uh, very interesting kind of way to look at this. There are um, other examples where in general, we like having a younger workforce. We really want to be known as the, here's where you, a great training ground, great stepping stone for you. We know in our financial model that, um, you know, if we have people stay with us for like three years, as an example, that's a really good um, goal for us. And we bring in new talent. This is kind of our, our model. And again, it's not about this is better or worse than anyone. It's really understanding how that all fits together with the workforce that you want to tap into. So what are some of these key questions that we need to be asking? And I really think at the end of the day, um, you can get great advice, but so much of this I think gets answered and um, you get to be able to protect your company when you spend a little time um, thinking about how this uniquely impacts your organization. If you're big enough and you have leadership teams um, or multiple levels of leadership teams, this is a great, great, great place to ask some of these questions right now so that um, you can be better prepared for these next normals. Simple question, do you actually know the breakdown of the generations in your workforce? Is that something that you're familiar with? So I'd be curious if anybody um, on the call right now has actually done this. Um, do you know how many people you have in each segment? And I would take it one step further than this. If you have divisions, um, do you know how it breaks down in different segments in your organization? It's a great thing to do. You can work with your HR and benefits people on this piece. And it, it's just a really interesting way to kind of say, oh, look, look, this is where this is. So do we have somebody who said yes? No, I was going to say, if anybody would like to say yes, just let me know. Oh, we have somebody raising their hand now. Hello, Tammy Murphy. You can make yourself visible too, if you'd like. Uh, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, Tammy? How are you all doing today? Good. 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 I'm actually happened to be in the payroll system. So I ran a report and we have eight baby boomers, 34 generation X, 24 generation Y and 17 generation Z or Z here in the U.S. Wow. Interesting. And that's in Gold's Gym, Middletown. Wow. That's a nice that's spread. Great. That's, and that's fancy. So I'm just curious. I mean, obviously you're Gold's Gym and I think that's such a great example because how many times do we think of fitness organizations as being younger? Yep. You know, younger right. employees in that, and yet having these older employees. So I'm curious from your perspective, you do have, how do you approach that as a leader? I mean, to be honest with you, when we look for folks, we look for personality. So, you know, usually they gel together. Um, we don't, we don't treat really anybody differently. You know, if somebody's at the front and they want a chair, obviously they sit down, um, but they kind of, it just kind of all works, Mim. We don't really treat anybody differently. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. And I think that's the thing. I think it's, it's, you know, creating that inclusive environment. And again, I have intentional inclusion equals better bottom line, but inclusion is not the same as intentional inclusion. Um, you know, there's plenty of data around this. And so I think, again, that's one of those things. So it's interesting when I hear we treat everybody equally. And again, like I said, equal versus equitable, right? right. So but I think in our position, it's a little different. Like in my finance role, I, I understand what you're saying. And that does make sense. I think in this job, you know, if they're young, they're not looking to climb the ladder at, at the shake bar or the, the service desk. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I it's agree usually, with that. It's right. usually a, a first stop. And then the older folks are, are retired and they're just looking for something to do. Some of them, they just like being social and, and hanging out in that, that culture. Yeah, no, and it's incredible. And you think about it, like in that particular culture, you know, aging with more years of health, what a great message that is for somebody who's even younger. I love the visual of that. It's just such a great example of how we can inspire each other to have like a healthier, more connected community. Um, data, data, data. <laughs> I can't overemphasize that from my perspective because um, what your perception is and what the data you know, tells us, um, that would be my next question. I've worked with a number of organizations where I've gone in and they said, oh yeah, well, our turnover is costing us or you know, this recruiting, it just takes us so long. And I said, great, so what are the dollar number? What's, what's the dollar amount around that? 
Like, you know, really, what is it costing you? Do you know? Have you drilled down enough to know what positions are leaving? Who's leaving? Um, who are you coming in? This is the due diligence that um, I, I so strongly believe in because it starts to make it clearer around why you have to have a strategy. So somebody that's a major rainmaker that walks out the door because they didn't feel included and goes to the next company. And you know, in order to recruit them, train them, and the amount of additional work now that's been put on the rest of your workforce all has a real dollar amount around it. And it has a health and well-being cost. Everybody gets stressed. If this was a loved person, why did they leave? Does this now put you at more risk because they've walked out the door? So um, some interesting questions around this piece that I'd ask you to consider if you do not have actual dollar numbers you know, um, around this can be very eye-opening. This one is one that I find very, very interesting. I was on a, a, on a call with, um, I actually did a, a training call with a large organization uh, just a week ago. And it was interesting because it was across the US and, and part, of, part of the audience was in Europe. And one of the big questions I asked, um, there was I think probably like 250 people on this call. Um, so does anybody know what your EAP is? And I got, I think I had one person, one, say, oh yeah, I know what my EAP is. EAP, for those on the call that are not familiar, that's your employee assistance program. Almost every organization has one of these. Um, you may have it uh, for smaller companies. Sometimes it's attached to a long-term um, benefits policy, believe it or not. Um, there are standalones. There are those that are incorporated with, with other benefit plans, but that is your mental health and well-being benefit. And so in the world that we are in right now, um, understanding what it is, how to use it, how to have access to it. And if you're a bigger organization that your leaders are very familiar so that if somebody on their team uh, may seem stressed or has told them a story where um, it can be anything from, my mom is really, really sick and she's in the hospital and I'm having a lot of issues dealing with all of this emotionally. Um, it could be, my kids are driving me crazy and my basement flooded and I'm just completely stressed out. Um, I know that sounds kind of, you know, lightweight, but it's a real thing. Um, you know, I'm going through a divorce and I'm getting very distracted and I, I really think I need somebody to talk to. You know, there are multiple scenarios, but the, the practical thing about this is that if you are an employer and you are paying for this, um, having a strategy around making sure that people understand when and how, and that goes back to, again, what do my employees need and want? What does each generational group or across the board really need right now instead of us guessing? And how do we align that with what we already are paying for and what we already have in place? How can we make those tweaks? So it doesn't have to cost you more money. And in many cases, it can mean getting better utilization for things that you're already paying for. Plus, the big bonus is, is that as people start to use these benefits and it helps them you get word of mouth within your organization if you do this the right way. So um, another huge opportunity to kind of look at something that you may already have um, and can help that bottom line and keep people more focused and engaged at work, depending on what's going on with them. And I'm a, you know, coming from the business world and having worked both in, you know, in, in finance and benefits underwriting, when it comes to anything around um, creating a more resilient workforce, I am a real stickler around true KPIs. Build a strategy that is specific to your culture. Um, I think that right now you have an opportunity to look at, okay, what has really worked for us? What got us through all these crises over the past you know, 18 months? Um, what was amiss? What didn't work? And what are the things that I'm still really questioning as a leader? You know, What is going to work best for me? Um, if I'm really confused, is there a, a leadership group, a coach, you know, a better way to approach this so that I can be better positioned, you know, to meet whatever fire drill or actual fire that's coming down the road. Um, and I think the other thing is, you know, we all want workforces that are creative, that, great, that give great customer service, that um, allow people to show up and truly present their ideas in a creative way. 
I find it very interesting. And I'll just tell you just as somebody, I haven't traveled in quite a while given where we've been, but when I was traveling regularly, I'm always um, very aware of a lot of how uh, hospitality is set up. And when you go into a hotel room and you know how it's set up. So I'm not going to say which chain it was or which hotel it was, but I went in and uh, everything that was printed or was on the phone was like an eight point, eight point font. I could not read it without my glasses. And I'm thinking, wow, I wonder who designed this. Like it was a cool room. It was beautiful. It was comfortable, but like these practical things. And I thought, well, huh, if they would have had like a diverse team looking at all the pieces of the puzzle here, that piece might've come up. So are they going to lose me as a client? Because I think, well, what if there's an emergency? Am I going to be able to read that phone at two o'clock in the morning if there's something going on? Or do I want to have things that are easy and accessible for me? And that's just an example of um, why you want to have this intergenerational conversation and how we can support that, that bottom line. So there are many, many more questions that could go into this. Uh, I strongly believe in taking the time to have conversations. And I understand right now that can be incredibly difficult. We have been challenged financially. Um, we know that there's a lot that we don't know. Um, but at the same time, carving out some of this time is going to be key for all of us as leaders. And it can strengthen, really strengthen us across um, the entire county in terms of who we are going to attract and retain in our own area. Um, and that's the other little data point that I thought was really interesting as I was doing research for this. You know, we hear a lot about people leaving the state of New York and going to, you know, going south or not doing business here. But um, we've actually grown here in Orange County, not, not a whole lot, but, um, but we have grown some and we are continuing to grow. And so I look at that as, as a real opportunity for us as business leaders, people moving out of the city that say, we don't wanna live in the city anymore. I don't wanna commute an hour and a half each way, which is something that I personally did for, for quite a few years. Um, how do we tap into that talent? And how do we then put these strategies in place and market them out there so that the talent you want knows that this is the organization that they'll have an opportunity to contribute to, that they will want to come and work for you, that they know that they will be heard and included. And um, for any of you that wanna do additional research around this, I highly encourage you to, and you can Google it, you know, Harvard Business Review data around intentional inclusion, diverse teams, um, intergenerational workforce. There's just wonderful, wonderful data out there for all the learners and, and data geeks like me. And um, with that, I just wanna thank you, thank you so much for your time. I truly hope that all of you are enjoying these first few days of summer and supporting your own health and well being. And I am happy to answer any questions. Does anybody have any questions for Mim? Two more minutes, or two more seconds. Well, while you're thinking about that, the other thing I want to um, just encourage everybody to do, GW4W Global Women for Wellbeing, it is free, um, is a white paper. It is research-based that was put out in 2018, but it talks very specifically about the caregiving issue. And super, super easy read, folks. <laughs> so I just want to tell you, it's not going to take time. It is fully cited. Um, but you can go to the website, you can download it for free if that's helpful to you. Um, and I also am happy to share any data if you're looking for any research out there. I, I am highlighting right now the KPMG report that came out in May around mental health and well being in the workplace. So, again, you can Google it. If you can't find it, just let me know. I'm happy to send you the link. Um, but moving forward, we have this huge opportunity and I am excited to see where we can all go as a county and so grateful to be part of Orange County Chamber of Commerce and part of our workplace wellness group and um, thank you for your leadership, Heather. Okay, thank you and thank you all that attended today. This has been recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel in, in a couple of days once we get it uploaded. Um, so tell your fellow members to take a look. Um, Mim, as always, so thankful for you sharing your expertise with us and have a great day, everyone. Great.